great day. Thanks for being in the house today. I believe this is better than the best hospital in town. Better than the best mental institute in town, although we do have mental cases in the house today. Some of those are ministers in the house. Some of those are everyone. How many wants to have a change of mind today? How many wants to go higher today? How many wants to say amen to something I say today? Amen. All right, praise God. Here we go. I'm ready to preach. Are you ready to listen? Yes. How many brought a Bible? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Tablets go up. Phones go up. Actual hard copies. The old version goes up. Yes, hallelujah. Bible. Say this. I am. I am. Everything. Everything. This Bible says I am. I have. See, some of you are starting to get this now. Bishop's been saying that for 40 years, and I think I understand what he's trying to tell me. I have everything this Bible says I have. And the person next to me can do what this Bible says. Hopefully I'll be able to do it too. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. You're going to Mark chapter 8 today. Mark chapter 8. Um, we'll just read this first verse that I want to start with. Uh, Mark chapter 8. This is the gospel according to Mark, not to be confused with the one in South Dakota. This guy was over in Israel. All right, there were two Marks. We have one on our staff. Uh, who is alive, Mark is now dead. But we're still reading it. Amen. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Verse 34, all the way down to the bottom. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Tell me when you're there. All righty. And when he had called the people unto him, everybody say, uh, could be a pretty good group of people. Don't know exactly how many, but quite a few. Yes? yes? Unto him with his disciples. His disciples would probably be the 12 at this time. Possibly some of the 70 also. He said unto them, whosoever. Everybody say whosoever. whosoever. He gives an opportunity. Everybody say opportunity. opportunity. It's an equal Opportunity if you're into today's language. <laughs> Equal opportunity. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Well, that doesn't sound like an equal opportunity. That sounds like you're everything, Jesus, and I'm nothing opportunity. Okay, well, let's back up and find out what happened leading up to this. This is not just a out of the blue, follow me or else deal. What we find leading up to this, and, you know, I didn't want to go back to chapter 6 and chapter 7 and, and chapter 8. I just thought I'd give a summary. Leading up to this, Jesus walked on water. We hear him walking on water. Water, troubled water, not just a bridge over troubled water like Simon and Garfunkel was talking about, but Jesus actually walked on the water. His disciples saw him do that. Some were afraid. One of them, uh, the zealous guy, said, Jesus, I'd like to walk on water too. And he did. A couple of steps. Jesus walks on water. In other words, he demonstrated the kingdom on how to rise above this natural world. The second thing he did, he heals a deaf ear. I've seen deaf ears pop open in even my day. But this was a demonstration of the kingdom, and this is to how to hear what God is saying. You can be deaf in the natural, but you can be deaf spiritually, and you cannot hear what God is saying. All who came and touched him or the hem of his garment was healed. This is to how to see what God is doing. What, what does God want to do in the earth? He wants to heal people. He wants to touch people. He wants to change people's lives. 
Jesus fed 4,000 with seven loaves. We fed about 4,000 last week, or at least the ones that was here ate like 4,000. <laughs> and there were seven left over. Uh, God was demonstrating through Jesus here supernatural provision. He found the progression. Being able to see and being able to hear and being able to understand what God is doing in his heartbeat and supernatural provision. These are all provided where? In the kingdom. Thereby say, in the kingdom. The Pharisees, however, and the disciples still can't see the word of God and the glory being demonstrated in front of them. They're still arguing about doctrine. Interesting. I want to talk about this theme of how people respond in the presence of God. Let me say that again. People respond differently when they experience a demonstration of the kingdom or are in the presence of God. Let me make this statement. Sinners and Christians both respond to the presence of God. All right, so... Jesus heals uh, a blind man as an example of being blind spiritually. The Pharisees couldn't see. The disciples couldn't see. So why did Jesus heal a blind man? Because he just got done dealing with people that could not see what happened right in front of them. Jesus does all of these miracles on purpose. Let me try this side. Jesus does all the miracles in the Bible on purpose. He heals somebody on the Sabbath on purpose just to make the hypocritical, pharisaical community mad. Saying that you've made your traditions so powerful I can't even, you know, do something good on the Sabbath. You've made the Sabbath a, a pain instead of a joy. Every time he does a miracle, he's demonstrating that the kingdom is higher than your thinking. So he heals a blind man because he says, listen, I can heal a blind man in the, in the natural easier. I can get your, your eyes open right. spiritually. Wow. wow. This is the final year of seeing. This is the year in the Hebrew, 5779. We've had a decade of two eyes. The evil eye happens to be larger than the good eye. So you have to focus a little better on the good eye. Because it's easier to see the evil eye than it is the good. This is the last year of seeing. You've got one more year to get your spiritual blind eyes open and see the kingdom. And see the glory. See what God in the flesh came to do and demonstrate so that you could know his heart, his purpose, and his call on your life. In this setting, Jesus said... How many understands this is a different deal now? Now he says, I'll tell you what, the things that I do, walk on water, open deaf ears, open blind eyes, supernatural provision, the things that I do, you'll do also. This is not just follow me because bless God, I'm going to ruin your life. He's saying, follow me if you want to do what I've just done. How many understand the opportunity is a little different now when we understand it in context? Now Jesus is saying, if you want to walk in the kingdom, if you want to live in the kingdom like I've been demonstrating to you, then this is all you have to do. Let's read it again. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Crucify the flesh. Bring your body under subjection. Hog tie it down so it doesn't do what it wants to do. Follow me. Clear your calendar. I've heard people say, well, you know, I've got a lot of things on my calendar. I want to keep my word. Well, as soon as you say that, you also have to understand that what you're doing also is denying his word. I don't know if you got that or not. Well, I'm going to keep my word. Yeah, but you're saying no to his word. So I'm not sure that's all that commendable. Clear your agenda is what Apostle Bardet said in this house one time. Clear your calendar. 
If you're going to walk in the kingdom, live in the kingdom, experience his glory, allow the glory to flow through your life, you're going to have to clear your agenda, deny yourself. And then just say, okay, whatever you have, Lord, here we go. What's on the schedule today? This is equal opportunity. I need to move along here. I'm trying to get done in a half an hour here. Say amen or oh my. Okay, either one will work. All righty. <laughs> Jesus makes it very clear in the call to find true life. He gives the requirements and the choice for everyone. So let's read on. Verse 35. For whomsoever will save his life. What's that mean? Keep doing what you want to do anyway. Well, then you'll lose this opportunity for kingdom life. I mean, you can't follow your own desires and follow his will at the same time. You can't, it, it just, it doesn't work. It's, a, it's an either or decision here. It's not a 50-50 thing. People try to, you know, find time in their schedule to put God in it. You're going to kill yourself. You're going to wear yourself out with that mindset. But whosoever will lose his life, meaning to say, I don't really care about this because I have seen something better. Yeah. Whoever will just lose the infatuation with it. Yeah. What are you enamored with? Okay. I mean, what, what is just, you know, you get a kick out of. Well, why don't you get a kick out of walking on water? I don't know. I think it's better. Supernatural provision, miracles, signs, wonders. Why wouldn't you want to make this choice? I, you know, I kind of sat with Jesus and some of the disciples and says, man, you're offering everybody that? And Jesus said, just watch who decides. I'm offering everybody, but it's not, we're not going to worry about crowd control. Let's relax. <laughs> Whosoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospels. Here's the point. You give your life for the gospel. What's that mean? Somebody else, like Prophet Liam up here prayed, I, I, I got to keep doing this because somebody else needs to hear about it. And I don't want them to take as long getting it as it's taken us. Because it's taken Liam for near his whole life getting there. <laughs> well, it took his dad longer to get there, and it took longer for his grandfather to get there. Yeah. Okay, moving right along. The Gospels. The same will save it. The one that loses their life will actually come into the place of understanding what true life is. Here's the call. The call has been given out in Jesus' day. I'm giving the same call out today. The call to find true life and live in the glory. I call you to true life and live in the glory. That's the call. Now, if you forgot the instructions, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Why take up your cross? Because that flesh is going to want to rise back up and remind you of your schedule. <laughs> Just saying. <clears throat> and you have to carry that cross a little more than 35 minutes or so, like during the service. It's like kind of take it home with you. All right, moving right along. I pray for the day that you realize what you think is important in your life does not compare and so falls short of what this opportunity that Jesus is offering you. Yeah. Amen. Yep. I don't know if I can repeat that sentence. That was a long one. I didn't even take a breath. <laughs> what are you exchanging God's eternal purpose for? Verse 36, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What's that mean? What does it profit if you 
um, you, you get all the trophies in a sport and then you break your leg and you can't play it anymore and the best you can do is watch somebody else play it. And then the trophies are rusting and dusty because you can't get off the couch because you've got a broken leg and you can't dust them. What, what shall it profit you? you? You gain the whole world. I mean, you get all this money in life and then you want to go, uh, you know, buy a motor home and, and travel around and vacation. You're old. You're too old. I've, I was in campgrounds and resorts watching these old people back these things up. It's, it's, a, it's a comedy show is what it is. You're too old to be driving that big a thing. You need to get a golf cart. Gain the whole world and, and you lost your life in the process. You don't have any life left to enjoy what you thought you was going to enjoy. Well, I want to travel the world. No, when you get that age, you just want to go to bed. You're going to take a nap three times a day. Am I making any sense to you? What are we, what are we after in life? And then finally we get it, and then we realize we missed out on the life that God had for us. Oh, my. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What, what are you trading in? Saying, God... This is more important than eternal life. And then you flip through the channels to find your best life now, preacher, to tell you how you can have your best life now. I guarantee you better listen to them. Because after you have your best life now, there's an eternity you're not going to have. What are you trading in for that? Okay. Let's see apostle hat. See if I can put a pastoral hat on now. It goes on to say here, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Verse 38, whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. You see, if you can't stand in front of the people that you're living amongst and talk about Jesus, you're ashamed to tell them of something righteous? I mean, they can cuss and swear and talk about anything, but you can't talk about the most holy God in front of those people. Jesus says, Him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when He comes in the glory of His Father with the holy angels. If you're embarrassed to talk to people about that, I guarantee you Jesus is going to be embarrassed to talk to you about the Father. I mean, how is He going to tell the Father, well, this is one of my children. This is, here's a Christian. He, he's ashamed to say that. This is, a, this is a presentation that Jesus gives, a call to anybody. Everybody say anybody and everybody. But somebody has to make the choice. This wasn't, you know, a choice they could make with, uh, you know, like next year. This was kind of like a today choice. Because then we read on Matthew or Mark chapter 9, verse 1, it's just a continuation. How many knows it's, it's not really a new chapter? We put chapters and verses to try to figure out so everybody can find something. This is just a continuation. And he said unto them, in other words, he's still talking to the same group about the same thing. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Talking to the same group. Some. Everybody say some. some. So everybody's been given the opportunity to see the kingdom and uh, come with power. What? In your life. Yeah. It's not that they didn't already see the kingdom come with power the last 40 days. But what he's saying is, there will be some that will experience the kingdom of God come in power to you. Okay. I, mean, I mean, like to, that, I, I like to be in that group. Yeah. Yes, all right. Now, shall not taste of death. See, here's, here's the problem. We, we picture this as death, death. Okay. Let, me, let me try this. What shall a man exchange in exchange for his soul. You see, the soul part here, 
it's like the opportunity died if you didn't make the choice. There are some of you standing here will not die to this opportunity. Some will not die to the opportunity. They'll not exchange in their soul for something else. But will taste it. How are we doing so far? Don't lose your soul for this opportunity. All right. We've seen the kingdom of God come with power this last week. Is that not true? How many did see it? Okay, that, that would be the, the same scenario as Jesus walked on water. We saw the prophet as a reed shaking in the wind. We saw him flow in prophecy. We saw people healed. We saw people delivered. We saw, how, how many saw the kingdom of God demonstrated? All right. Now, I can't assume that everyone saw the kingdom come. Because as the same in Jesus' day, the disciples and Pharisees were still arguing about doctrine. They were still back in the religious Bible study mode. Trying to figure out if I don't like the Message Bible or the King James or if, you know, the New American Standard or, you know, I don't know if I believe in that Torah or not. I know one person, personally I know, I know one person came to just get a word of prophecy. And when he got it, he left. He won't be back until the prophet comes in town again. Because I haven't seen him since the prophet was in town last time. <laughs> I know one came to get healed. They got healed and left. Went back to their religious church. Did they see the kingdom? No, they came for a certain thing. Some came to hear and watch the prophet. This is the best entertainment week that I've seen in church for a long time. They don't really show up for the teacher anymore. Elder Christie was telling me one time, she said, I don't think anybody's listening to me. I said, I, I know. If you prophesy, everybody will pay attention. You know, jerk and shake or something. But, you know, if you just stand up and then share the word, who's interested in that? I mean, come on. The day we're living in, come on, think it through. <laughs> and some maybe just came out of obligation. Bless God, Bishop be ticked at me if I don't show up every night. <laughs> no, I mean, come on. I, you just have to understand. Just, just because the presence of God comes into a room, it doesn't mean everybody understands what's going on. They see different things. Everybody say they see different things. Now, Mark chapter 9 and verse 2, which is like the next verse. Just, are you following me? You know, I, I hate to spend so long on four verses, but you know, there's a lot in it. There's a lot of mind games going on. There's a lot of thinking going on. Hello? I mean, Jesus just asked a question and our whole life is shook up. Verse 2. And after six days, underline that. After six days, when does the after six days start? Well, it wasn't the six days of seeing the glory. It was after six days from having seen the glory. which would be this last week for you, which is different than when you seen the glory. Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John. Oh, I think we get it now. Jesus asks the question and then waits six days. What's happening in those six days? Well, Jesus didn't come back and ask any more questions. He just observed for six days and decided that was the only three that responded. Responded to what? They denied themselves. They took up their cross and they was there ready to follow him. Well, what happened to the rest of them? Well, they were busy doing something else. They went back to their regularly scheduled program.
Amazing what you can get out of four or five verses, isn't it? You know? All right, so after six days, Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John and leads them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. Leads them up into the mountain of God. Leads them into the kingdom of God. Well, I thought we just saw the kingdom. Yeah, that was heaven on earth. Jesus brought heaven to earth. He brought the kingdom to the earth and demonstrated it. So we all experienced someone else bringing it to us. Now, Jesus is saying, all of you can do what I do, but in order for you to do what I do, you have to get up to this mountain and be in, saturated in this glory. And what three of them, according to Jesus' observation, qualified for that? And he took them up into that mountain. It was only three of the twelve. But those three, if you'll understand, went on to write epistles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Peter, James, and John. They wrote epistles. In other words, they actually had something to say. Yeah, yeah. The rest of the disciples were just newspaper reporters. Yeah. I mean, if you read Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke, and John at that time, those four Gospels, they just wrote what they saw. It was just a newspaper report. Yeah, yeah. But the epistles is... He did something in me, and I'm telling you what he did in me. These other guys are reading their prayer. Peter is praying the prayer. It's another tangent. Are, is the glory coming out of us, or are we writing down the glory that we've seen from somebody else? Three of the twelve. <clears throat> Verse two. And Jesus was transfigured before them. Transfigured or transformed. The Greek word is metamorphosis. It literally means to change. He was formed before their very eyes. There was an instantaneous change. Metamorphosis. When you really get in the glory, not just observe the glory, when you get into the glory, you will be changed. No glory, no change. Bible study, no change. Glory, change. The three saw the transforming power of Christ. You see, they, they saw the change, not the prophecy, not the healing, not the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the thing. They saw the change. Yeah. Some people come to see the stuff. The three come to see change. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The city needs to change. Thank God if God-fearing people get into positions of governmental authority. But I tell you, unless people's hearts change, there will still be rapists and thieves and murders and, and the like. What do we need in our country? A heart change in the people. Verse 3, it says, His raiment became shining exceeding white as snow. They quit wearing jeans with uh, 47,000 slits in them and bands around their legs and headbands and all sorts of stuff acting like gang members. It's a change. They don't get more tattoos. They don't get more piercings. They don't get more. No, there's a change. When, when you change, so is your clothes. When you change, so does your actions. When you change, see, we try to change people's actions. We, I can't change your action. If, if, if God will touch your heart, you'll change. Uh, verse 4, And there appeared unto them also Elias and Moses. Very interesting. Here on this Mount of Transfiguration, we see a couple of qualifications necessary for change. 
Uh, Moses representing the law, the commandments, the Torah. Elijah representing the spirit, the prophets. Until the law and the prophets, until the law and the spirit work together, there's no change. You're not going to change with just law. Law is not going to change you. But then all spirit and no law, you don't know what to change to. Right? I have to have the law, the heart of God, the instructions of God, and then the spirit to make the change in my life so that what? Well, I change to doing his will and not mine. They, they, they have to work together. So they saw on the mountain the requirements to walk in the kingdom and glory. You have to know what his kingdom is, the rules of his kingdom. You have to walk in the power of the spirit or no one's life is going to be changed. You're not going to walk on water. You're not going to open blind eyes. You're not going to, you're not going to do that with the law. You have to have the power of the spirit to do that. But you have to have the law to know that's the will of God so that you could be confident in moving in the spirit of that. They saw the law and the prophets, the Torah and the spirit working together in agreement. The one who keeps the law and the prophets or keeps the instructions of God and flows in the spirit qualify for the glory. Now, Peter answered and said to Jesus. Now, here, here's Peter in the, <laughs> in the presence of God, right? Here's Peter in the glory. Here's Peter experiencing the kingdom manifestation. People react differently in the presence. So I want to talk to you about this. <clears throat> Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it was, a, it was good for us to be here. Well, hello. That's kind of an understatement, a manifestation of the Father. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Elijah and Moses show up. The glory cloud is all there. It, it, it's good that we should be here. Yeah, it was a good meeting to be at. Yeah, not bad. That's better than whatever movie was showing downstairs. Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we should be here. Let us make three tabernacles, which tells us this is during the Feast of Tabernacle season. One for you, Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elias. So Deacon Heath, let's have three Sukkots out there, one for Jesus, one for the law, and one for the prophet. Amen. Or at least next year, you can get one for Minister Ryan, one for Reverend Connie, and... Verse 6, this is, this is precious. I don't know if you ever read this. For he wist not what to say, King James. He was so, so stunned, he had no clue of what to say, but he felt like he had to say something. How many felt like that way? Something ought to be said. I mean, it, it's probably going to be stupid what I say, but I, you know, I seem like I got to say something. You know, I can't, I'll never forget the pastor I was golfing with. He missed a little short putt you know, and uh, he was uh, of the skin color of my brother over here, you know, and so we were golfing together, good friends, and he says, he missed that putt, and he looked up at me, and he looked down and had this look on his face, you know, and he says, you know, I don't cuss, but something ought to be said. You get into the presence of God, and people want to, they, they have to do something. They feel like they have to do something. Now, the Lord has specifically designed you, a human being, for the glory. You are wired for the glory of God in your life. You were made spirit, soul, and body. He created you such for the containment of his presence and his glory. The glory is that manifested presence of the Father. Jesus said, the works that I do, it's the Father in me. He doeth the works. The glory is what does the work. It's the manifested presence of the Father that comes in and upon a person, enabling them to demonstrate the power 
of the kingdom so others can see it. Now, I know in my own life when, you know, when I pray and I seek to enter into his presence, I don't just study scripture. I mean, I've got to get into the presence and find out what he wants to do about it. And when I get in there, I've never felt it so strong that I had to run out of the house. You know what I mean? But I have every single time I would get into his presence, all of a sudden, my mind would be bombarded with all the things that I had to do. That was worth an amen or oh my right there. All of a sudden, man. I mean, come on, you got to make those phone calls. You got to call that person back. You, you, you got to get that email sent out. You got to get that thing done. My, you got to get working on this. It's, it, and all of a sudden, like, okay, the presence or my calendar. I'm sorry, calendar wins out most of the time. Well, if it does for Bishop, I don't feel so bad. Yeah, see, I brought good news to you today. <laughs> <laughs> you see, uh, the problem is what takes place is we want to be responsible with that presence. I felt his presence, so I need to do something with it. Build a suit coat. I got to do something to send an email. Man, as soon as that presence is on me right now, I want to call somebody. Ikamo Shandai. We got to do something. Should we do something? Or should we just shut up for a little longer? Now, I've seen when the presence comes into a room that people respond differently. I look around during praise and worship and I see what people are doing. They're either raising their hands or they're chewing gum. They're either looking around or they've got their eyes closed. They're, they do different things. I can't assume that Everyone recognizes that the presence is there, but yet it seems to me impossible that they don't. All right. Now, when the presence comes in, you can see where people are at with their walk in the Lord. Let me try one more time. When the presence of God comes in, and it did this morning, when the presence of God comes in, immediately I can observe where people are at with their walk with the Lord. Because that's either something that they experienced through the week or that was, that was a absolutely brand new to them. They've never seen that before. Not to scare you. It's just like Jesus. He observed everybody that saw all the miracles and he said, come follow me. And then he just looked to see how people responded to the presence of the Lord. And he is able to discern which ones can go into the mountain and which ones don't care. They, they don't deem it valuable. They still have something else that's more valuable in their life than, than that. See, this is the moment that the Father offers us a treasure that is heavenly. And what we do in that moment we either grab a hold of that treasure with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, or we say, you know, I got one, I got a fake one back home. The Bible says that all of sin and cut fell short of what? The glory. It's not all of sin that are going to hell. All of sin and fell short of what? The glory. Only three made it up into the glory out of all of those people. All of those people what? Sinned. Was it, well, they just fell short of the glory. They fell short of the mark. They, they fell short of the opportunity. They did not value that opportunity well enough to give their whole life to it. The original intention for humanity is to live in the kingdom and his glory. That was God's intent with Adam and Eve. I want them to rule and reign. I want you to live in the kingdom and the glory. I want you to be my established kingdom in the earth. 
And throughout all history, as I taught at the beginning of Tabernacles, he's just always looking for those three that will come up into the mountain and be his kings and priests. The, the dilemma I have is when I preach the kingdom and I preach this opportunity and I share this, my dilemma is, is it, is that you just refuse, you rebel, or you just don't get it. You just don't see it. Deacon Heath said this morning, I, you know, I've been asking God this question for quite a while. I, you know, God, what do they do? Just, they don't like what I say? They don't want to come out of the mountains? You know, I've preached Gideon's army. Get your head out of the water. You're, you're just looking at the water, see your reflection. My God, raise up. There's a war going on. The seven mountains, get out. God's going to judge them. The five wise, five foolish, hello. Do you have any oil or are you just plain religion? It's serious. And then I watch people just continue on doing the same thing. After... After amazing prophecy, after a healing, after a deliverance, and then you just go right back to their regular scheduled program. I, what are you, rebellious? Are you just simply saying no, or, or don't you get it? Don't you see it? I, I, I've yet to totally know which one. I asked Deacon E this morning, he said, oh, I saw it, I just didn't care. I love how Deacon just, just flowers it up and polishes it up. Well, verily I say unto thee, Bishop, it's really... Uh... No, he just said, I, I, I didn't care. I saw, but I didn't care. I don't count it valuable. I, I don't know where you're at today. After these seven days of seeing the glory. And then six days to decide whether you're going to let go of your life and follow him, or you're just going to go back to the same thing and wait till next year. Christians and sinners do different things in the glory. Sinners immediately want to get out of it. They want to get away from it. Let me just try witnessing somebody and all of a sudden they just got to go. Well, that, that's, a, that's a, if you can see it, they're getting away from the presence is what they're getting away from. They're uncomfortable. They want to get away from the presence. But then Christians, they get restless and think they have to do something. We react with our knowledge, our passion, and our talent. We immediately, we want to impress God with what we can do. The teacher wants to teach. I thought I'd pick on her first. The prophet wants to prophesy. We used a moment to get things done. Bless God, the anointing is here. We better do something. We better teach something. We better prophesy something. We better spit on somebody. Bless God, lay hands on somebody. Shandai and a bow tie, I'm going to ride your Honda if you don't get it started, you know. <laughs> listen, I've said many times, listen to me, I've, I've said many times, you need to, t in the presence of God, you need to take your imaginary eyeballs as erasers and erase your chalkboard of all the wonderful things that you could do for God now that, that his presence is here. Just erase it. And then let him give you a thought. It will be much better than all the points and subpoints that you've already got up there. Well, I need to prophesy to everybody. He probably is saying, no, I just want you to shut up and look stupid for a minute and confound the wise. I mean, just, you got to stop and say, what are you saying? Open your x-ray vision this year. What are you doing? Then we can get involved in what he's doing. He said, deny yourself. Well, I can play an instrument. Well, don't think of that first. Well, I can sing. Well, don't think of that first. Well, I can prophesy. Well, don't think of that first. Don't think of anything first. Just think about not thinking first. Lay your little staff down and let God turn it into something supernatural. Lay your gift down. Lay your talent down. Lay how good you are down. 
And then pick up what he wants you to pick up. He, he may pick up the prophecy. He may pick up the teaching. But let him be the one that does that. You follow him in it. Am I making sense to you? Listen, it's called the gifts of the spirit, not the gift of knowing in the natural. I've had some people here. Well, I know there's somebody online right now that's got this pain somewhere and somewhere. And then I find out afterwards, the guy says to me, man, I thought they were going to be online this morning. Okay, well, that's not a gift of the spirit, bucko. Stop that stupidity. When I flow in the gifts, somebody knows it's, it's always there. It's not because I know something. Some of these things, it's like, I'm, I'm surprised God knows it. How do I do that? I take my imaginary eraser and erase everything and just say, what do you want to do? Yeah. It's important what he wants to do. We follow him. I have to get up into that mountain, though. Are you with me? Yeah. In praise and worship, you've got to quit chewing gum and looking around and staring and blowing your nose and running to the bathroom 14 times. I mean, you, you, come on. Showtime. Yeah. This is it. This is our opportunity. This is our moment. In the presence of God, it should be the most valuable moment of your life. Okay. You getting anything out of this? Habakkuk 2.14. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. This is God's heartbeat. The knowledge. The knowledge is to know by observation, instruction, designation, and punishment. Don't have time to preach on the punishment part. But all of it demonstrates the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. It does not say the whole earth is going to be filled with the glory. It's going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory. Only three is going to be filled with the glory. But the rest of them are going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory. They're going to observe it. So there's different groups of people. Everybody say different groups of people. There's the 5,000. I've taught on that. They just showed up for the buy a meal. Well, thank God, because the three has to have some miraculous thing to do, or we don't have any ministry. The 70 show up. They see the meetings and they go tell somebody. You just got to tell somebody. Man, it was really stinking cool what happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they weren't in the mountain. They, were, they observed what happened because of the mountain. Right. Yeah. And then there's the 12. They're, they're going to, you know, sing the same song next week. They're going to preach the same message next week. They're going to pray the same prayer that they prayed for the last 100 years. In 50 years, they're going to cut and paste the same thing they've done forever. Hallelujah. Write it down. We'll use it. Thank God you're in one of these groups. Do you know it's better to be in the 5,000 group that you actually experience the presence of God? It's great that you're in the 70 group that you at least want to tell somebody else and you're not just thinking about yourself. It's great that you're one of the 12, part of the, part of the team, you know? Because the, when the three comes down, they've got to have somebody to talk to. Yeah. It's the rest of the support team. Thank God you're in that group. Mm -hmm. yeah. And good news to those that are in the three group. Man, this is going to be the best year of your life. This is going to be a red velvet year. Yeah. This is going to be, man, what a year to live in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> How's the earth going to be filled with this glory? Well, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. They're not going to see the glory unless they don't see the glory in you. Right. Yeah. Each time we're in his presence, he deposits a measure of glory in our life. I say each time we're in his presence, he deposits a measure of his glory. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world. I mean, don't be, don't be squeezed and obligated to this world. But be transformed by, transformed, transformed, changed, remember? Yeah. Yeah. The mount, when you get into the presence, transformed by the renewing of your mind. What happens when you get in the presence? You change your mind about something. 
How do you know you've changed? You see it different now. I mean, I, I've changed my mind about that. I mean, I don't want that anymore. I used to love it, and now I don't want it. I mean, I've probably given up on most chips, except the ones that Minister Ryan Bryan's from Pennsylvania. So, I mean, from glory to glory, from chip to chip, my mind is being renewed. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, how many had a mind change during the week of tabernacles? One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, even the little, how old are you, six years old? Yeah. That's good because, man, I'll tell you, his mind has been set for a whole five years, and that's hard <laughs> to get a mind change after it's been set in cement for years. So that you might prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, the only way you're going to understand what really is the will of God is for your mind to change to see it for what it is. Well, I come to church once a week. Well, that's good. I mean, God's impressed. But acceptable. Well, I come on Wednesday nights too. Okay, now we're getting there. Well, what's the perfect? You deny yourself. You you take up your cross. You you think about the gospel more than than you and what you want to do. And then... A hundredfold in this life, whatever you give up, will come back to you. Here's the point I wanted to make. Transformed people transform cities. How many wants to transform the city or your city? Well, it's going to take transformed people to transform the city. Transformed people get there through a transformed perspective of reality. They change their mind. You have to start thinking from God's perspective. That's why I gave that homework assignment to read Habakkuk in the Message Bible. Read it through once with the newspaper in mind. Read it through the second time if you were in his place. How would you react to that? In that change of mindset, we'll start knowing how to pray for our city to change. God never looked at the earth and said, oh my God, what am I going to do? This is a mess. He never approached it from lack. He always approached it as I have more than I need. Can he change this city with three? Can I change this city with three? I thought about that the other day. How how many people in this scenario this week made the right choice? How many has got this in your pocket or you forgot that you was even (laughs) supposed to have it? Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Did somebody trade this in for something else this week? You know? I mean, did uh, through the week, did you uh, change clothes into your Seven Mountains clothes and forgot to put this in it? You know? Uh, If this is still in your heart and you had to probably fight for this this week, then it's God is looking at you and saying, maybe you really do want me more than all that other stuff. A transformed people will transform the city. Jesus did not say, oh, come on, three out of all these? He He didn't respond that way. He just said, Peter, James, and John, I see that's how you responded, let's go. It's more than enough to change. This is what I thought this morning. Jesus only had three. Who do I think I am that I would have more than three? I mean, come on. I don't don't feel bad that I don't have 25. You know, floating, walking on water, you know. Changing seven loaves into, you know, enough to feed the whole Help Incorporated uptown. Wherever you are, thank God you're there. So, last verse, 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty means freedom from obligation. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, you're free from the obligations of this world. It means freedom to experience the things of God. It's not freedom from God, but freedom in God. You're you're free to live, dance, express the change from the experience of the glory. 
Your testimony becomes, he changed me. It's not he blessed me so I could do my mountain thing. No, he changed me. I don't want the mountain thing. And I'm more excited about this than I am the mountain thing. That's expressing his glory in the earth. They have not seen that. It says here, we with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. We're looking into a mirror. How many looked into a mirror this morning? How many uh, said, I do not have the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind and a comb and a brush and some makeup? Yes, I am more than a conqueror uh, through Christ Jesus. But you look, at, uh, the, you, you look in the mirror and you see something. You have to be honest. If you don't look in the mirror and, and realize where you're at or what you look like, we'll videotape you and send it to you. While I'm preaching, I'm going to videotape your faces and send it to you. No, go ahead. A glass, a mirror. What do you see in that mirror? Every time we're in the presence of the Lord, we should see more of him in that mirror. Try it one more time. Every time we come into his presence, we behold with open face the glory of the Lord and are changed into the same image. The image of what? The glory of the Lord. We're changed into that. Every time we come into it, it's superimposed on us. Every time you get in the sun, something changes. The more you're in the sun, the more... <laughs> <coughs> the more the change. You want to make it sense to you? How much glory is on your face? Direct relation to how many times you get into it. Can you get to the place where you look in the mirror and all you see is God? When someone looks at you, that's all they see. Oh man, you're a Christian. I can tell when you walked in, you're a Christian. You're different. You're really different. You're, I love you, Mrs. Anderson. You're so cute. It's just because she is in a needy situation and she sees something different about Reverend Connie than all the other teachers. When you walk into the room, do people either want to get away from you or they're drawn to you? Which is it? Did God touch your heart today? Did he change your mind today about something? If that happened, that's because you experienced his presence, his touch. If you thought, well, Bishop didn't preach as long as I thought maybe he was going to, well, then, then you're blessed today. Amen. Here's the altar call today. Somebody wants to just go stand in the mirror and stand in his presence for a moment. So that's what we're going to do right now. We're just going to worship him and stand in his presence and expect that presence to change our mind about something today. And every time we do that, we leave that place and we're changed and we're transformed. And when we're transformed, we'll transform somebody else. You were made for his glory. You were wired for his glory. You have the capacity to receive his glory. But you just have to clean out some room for it. You just have to decide you want that more than something else. How many got something out of this today? Father, I pray for everyone listening online and I pray that this word becomes life in your life. I pray that you see the opportunity that Jesus has presented to you today. The most valuable opportunity that I see exists in eternity. The part that you can be in the ministry just like he was in the ministry. Jesus said, the works that I do, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, lame people walk, rise above circumstances, not have fear, no evil come nigh my dwelling place, people can't touch me and kill me, I, I take up my life, I lay my life down. Wow, he said, these things you can do. Because it's the Father in him that did it. It's the Father in you that can do it also. I don't say that that happens over at night. It appears that this is a process. 
and it's coming up to the mountain to pray and it's coming up the mountain to worship and it's coming up one more time to be in the presence of God. Not for any other thing than to experience Him and for Him to impact your life. If He impacts your life, you can't help but impact somebody else's life. That's just how it works and God knows that. Let Him change your life today. Take time to enter into His presence in the morning, in the afternoon, whenever, but try to just get alone and just think of nothing but just being in His presence. Say, Lord, change me. My prayer lately has been, Lord, draw me close to You. Father, just draw me close to You. Let Him pull you into that. Peter said, bid me to come walk on the water, Lord. And Jesus responded so quickly, come on. Come on. You may sink in the presence pretty quick, but you'll get better at it. And the more you do, the more you'll love it. I call you blessed today. Let this word become life in your life. Amen. Instrument, let's worship. I just wanna be